welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, M&R is an advocacy consulting firm. We're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I work in the New England office, which we have our, we're actually in Woburn, is where our office is. Um, and we have about 100 employees across the country that work on policy advocacy across a very wide range of issues. We in our, in my New England office, we do a lot of public health advocacy. We do communication, criminal justice work, a lot, lot of different issues. Um, and I have a lot of, many more years of experience in advocacy than I will quote to you, so too many. But I want to get a sense of just quickly, by a show of hands, who we've got in the room, because we can't obviously do introductions with a big group. Um, first question, just by a show of hands, how many people in the room would consider themselves an advocate? Awesome, good answer, right answer. How many people either previously have or currently um, done advocacy as a volunteer for, another or for an organization or for a campaign? Great. How many people have done uh, or currently or previously done advocacy as part of your paid job? OK, a lot. Great. And how many people are currently working on a policy advocacy campaign? Anyone in the room? Awesome. OK, that's great. That's really helpful for me just to know we've got a mix. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk fast. Um, we did not have time for Q&A in the last session, but what I had offered up to people is you can email me after the training or give me a call and I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions. Um, we just have such a tight time frame today. So we're gonna jump right in. Here's our objectives in a, in a very short period of time. I am gonna seek to increase your knowledge about policy advocacy and its role in decreasing health disparities and promoting health equity. Uh, here in Western Massachusetts. The things we're going to talk about, we're going to start with some definitions. What is advocacy? Important that we're all on the same page. We're going to talk about the three key questions that we must always begin an advocacy campaign with. We'll talk about what those are and, and what the good answers should be. We'll talk about key stakeholders, who they are, how to find them, how to engage them, key partners, and then how to build relationships with key decision makers. Um, because at the end of the day, so much of advocacy really boils down to building relationships. Uh, so that's what we're going to seek to cover. But first things first, let's talk about what is advocacy. So advocacy, very simply, when I use that word, what I'm talking about is the application of pressure and influence on the people who have the power to give us what we want. So this cute little boy in this picture um, wants this puppy. He wants a new puppy. Um, I don't know how many of you are the same sucker as me and you've caved to such pressure, not once, but twice, and then again twice for the other second dog. Um, but some of you have been in this very position. So in my house, um, my kids wanted a dog. They knew both parents, mom and dad were the decision makers, but they knew ultimately that I was the key decision maker. That if I said no, it wasn't gonna happen because I was really the one that was gonna take care of the damn dog anyway, which is indeed the way it goes. Um, so my kids knew how to get to me and push my buttons, right? They used guilt, they told me that everybody else has a dog and we're so sad without a puppy. They, they were extra sweet, extra helpful around the house, told me how much they were gonna help out with the dog which was a lie and I caved this little boy is an advocate he knows how to get what they what he wants he knows who his key decision maker target is and he knows how to to apply pressure and influence to get that decision maker to give him what we want that's advocacy we are born with these skills if you think about a child who doesn't want to go to bed at night or the teenager who wants a later curfew they're advocates. We're born with those skills. And, and really, when we do policy advocacy, we're just applying those same principles and skills to, to advance a policy. So when I say policy advocacy, what I'm really talking about is attempting to change, generally it's a law or a regulation, or some sort of a formal policy, maybe an institutional or organizational policy. But most often, it's a law or a regulation. And that includes budget. So when Representative Kulik was talking about state budgeting process, the state budget is considered a piece of legislation. So if we're working on budgetary issues, that's also um, policy advocacy work. When I use the word campaign, because you'll hear me say that, I'm not talking about um, an electoral campaign, someone running for, for office. Um, and the ads are driving me crazy. I don't know about everyone else, but November feels like a very long time from now. Um, when I say campaign, what I'm talking about is simply a set of activities that are structured to give us what we want uh, towards our policy goal. A campaign has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a very clear, specific end goal that we're aiming for, again, that law or that regulation, and we craft a series of activities to achieve our outcome, to influence a decision maker to say yes and give us what we want. That's all I mean when I say campaign. 
I want to talk about the difference between advocacy and lobbying because sometimes people lump them into the same bucket and they're actually very different. Lobbying is always advocacy, but advocacy is not just lobbying. There is a whole range of advocacy activities that are much broader than lobbying. There's a whole lot of education need, that needs to happen in advocacy that's not lobbying. Lobbying is a very specific, um, the legal definition of lobbying is actually a very specific type of communication. There's, a, there's two different um, forms here. The first is what we call direct lobbying, and, and I just want to say I'm not a lawyer in any way, so this is not my legal, um, I'm, this is not legal advice. Um, but I will tell you that this is the general definitions, and if you have questions about whether you and your organization can do lobbying, ask your supervisor, not me. Um, but lobbying, as it's defined by the IRS, is communication with a lawmaker about a specific piece of legislation and expressing a view. So it would be calling my state senator and saying, um, hey, I live, in, uh, I live in Springfield, and uh, there's a particular program. Give me the name of a particular program in Springfield. Anyone? Name your organization. YMCA. The YMCA in Springfield needs more funding. I want you to put, give us more funding in the state budget this year. That's lobbying. That's a lobbying ask. Indirect lobbying, or the second type of lobbying, is communication with the public. So in this case, it's communication with the public about a particular piece of legislation. We express a view, and, there, and we include a call to action. So in this case, maybe we write a letter to the Springfield Republican, a letter to the editor, in which we talk about the need for more funding at the YMCA in Springfield. We end, we urge the public to call their state senators. And so it's lobbying to the public, but it's a different form of lobbying, but that is also lobbying. So not, so again, advocacy is on a broad range or a continuum. Lobbying is a particular piece of advocacy, but advocacy is much broader than that. So who can lobby? Nonprofit organizations can and do lobby. Um, they need to account for their lobbying time and resources, and there's a limit on how much they can spend, how much time and money they can spend on lobbying. But nonprofit organizations can and do lobby. Uh, contract lobbyists also do lobbying, and these can be, uh, working for nonprofits or companies, for-profits, um, and these are individuals who just do lobbying, the lobbying parts of advocacy campaigns. Um, lawmakers certainly lobby one another. They do it all the time. And most importantly, anyone as an individual can lobby. So you, on your own time, on your own dime, can lobby as much, as often, as frequently as you want about the issues that are important to you, and I hope you do. Um, so anyone can lobby as an individual. Um, but again, in our organizations, we can't all lobby and we can't all lobby all the time. So let's debunk some of the myths about advocacy. Is everyone clear on advocacy versus lobbying? Any questions on that before I move on? Okay, great. So let's talk about some of the myths. And the first one, um, some of the young people in the room are not going to know um, what this first picture is. But the first myth is that what we learned in school isn't all that factual. Um, some people, yeah, so some of you recognize this. And then I see some blank faces. They have no idea. They're like, what is that? Um, Schoolhouse Rock, yeah. that rings a bell. So this was a very adorable Schoolhouse Rock video. I think it's on YouTube for the young people in the room. You can go home and Google it. Um, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. And it made it sound like getting a bill to become a law was this very democratic, logical, linear process. It made sense. Um, the reality is that that is not the way legislation happens. It's really a lot more like General Hospital. <laughs> it's a lot about relationships and who knows who and who's talking to who today and who owes who a favor. Um, and, it's, and it can feel very much like a soap opera a lot of the time. And it often feels not very democratic either. Um, now the bad news in that is that sometimes it doesn't feel democratic and it feels like a soap opera. The good news in that is that it's about relationships and relationships are so important in advocacy that, that what that means is that we as individuals can be tremendously powerful if we build relationships with our key decision makers. Um, and so just to sort of keep that in mind, but really important to know, you know, that little jingle, mm, it's not really the way it works. I mean, yes, there's a process that bills need to move through. Um, but there's a lot of turns and detours and roadblocks along the way. It doesn't really happen as nicely and neatly as that. The second myth is that the guy or the girl who's in charge isn't always the guy or the girl who's in charge. So when you guys hear about the health, Affordable Care Act, health care reform, what do people all call it? Obamacare. Obamacare. 
The reality is that President Obama really isn't the one that got that law to happen. Ted Kennedy probably rolls over in his grave when he hears people call it Obamacare because he was working on that for a long time, as were a lot of other people. The reality is, yes, the president has a lot of power and influence. He can introduce legislation. He can veto legislation. He can rally his party um, to, to get behind pieces of things that he supports. But it's really the members of Congress that really make legislation happen in this country. And at the state level, it's the members of our state legislature that make legislation happen. They're really the ones that make it move or not move. But it's important to know that within that, there's really only a small number of individuals who are in leadership positions that really have the power to make something happen or not. Those members in Congress and at the state legislature, they're not all equal. They don't have wield, yield or wield equal power. So here in Massachusetts, our Speaker of the House, our Senate President, and chairs of particularly relevant committees, depending on what issue we're working on, they're the real key decision makers generally. It's not the whole legislature. So really important to know that. The last myth um, that I hear people talk a lot about is I don't know how to do it, or it's too hard, or it's a little bit scary. I don't know how to call my lawmaker. What's that, you know, go to the state house. I don't, I don't, I don't really know if I can do that. Um, and I want to just sort of give you my own personal story about how, you know, this is a myth. To me, this is just a myth. So um, this is me. It was the 1980s, can you tell? <laughs> Big, poofy sleeves. Um, this is my husband and I, 25, almost 25 years ago, uh, when we got married. And this was my first foray into advocacy, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. I had no idea what advocacy was. I'm not sure I would have been able to tell you really what it meant at all in any way. And I was very young. I was like 12 when I got married. When I say 25 <laughs> years ago, I was like 10, maybe 10. Um, my parent, my, basically when my parents said, you know, here's how we think the reception should go, I was like, yeah, that sounds great. I went along, whatever. The one issue I stuck my heels in the ground on was around I wanted a smoke-free reception. This was before my years in tobacco control policy advocacy. And I, it had nothing to do with knowing any data or information around smoking. I just knew I hated it. It made me cough. It made me sneeze. My parents had spent a lot of money on that dress with the poofy sleeves, and I didn't want it to smell like smoke. <laughs> well, this was a really big deal. My parents freaked out, and the reception hall freaked out. And they said, we, we, we can't have a policy. Like, we can't tell people not to smoke. And I said, yes, you can. And I pushed, and I pushed, and I pushed my parents to then push the reception hall. And guess what? I had a smoke-free reception, which was awesome. I was an accidental advocate. I had no idea that's what I was doing at the time. But I changed that policy of that reception hall for that one wedding. I'm sure they went right back after that. Um, but that was my foray into advocacy. Part two of becoming an advocate was this. This is my son, Jake, my second son. And he was born with a very serious, life-threatening congenital heart defect. He has half a heart. He had three open heart surgeries. And if you have ever been in the position, as I know many of you have, of being a caretaker for someone who is ill, you know that you become an advocate immediately. Mm -hmm. And no one has to tell you how to do it. You know how to do it. You've got all those skills. And that was my second foray into becoming an advocate. And this is long before I did professional advocacy for work. Um, that's how I learned to be an advocate. So it's really not hard. When you're motivated and when you care about your end goal, it's really not that hard. And it, can't be, it really shouldn't be intimidating, because it's really not that hard. Hello, Frank. Hey, How are you? Are you doing? Good. I'm coming here to heckle you. Are you going to heckle me from the front row? Because I don't have a lot of time to be heckled. <laughs> so let's talk about the role of policy advocacy in uh, promoting health equity, because that's obviously why you all came out today. So. How many people are familiar with the county health rankings and roadmaps by a show of hands? Awesome. Tremendous resource. If you haven't been on there, write down the website, or when you get the PowerPoint, you can click on it. Um, it's a tremendous resource, resource from the University of Wisconsin. And they, basically, you can search by county, and you can pull up a tremendous amount of data, health-related data, about your county. You can't search by city and town, unfortunately, but by county. And you can look at how your county compares statistically to the rest of the country and to the rest of the state. And so what I've done is I pulled for each of the Western Mass counties, not Worcester, um, <laughs> Berkshire, Franklin, Hamden, and Hampshire. I've pulled a couple of the statistics that jumped out to me around health disparities. And if you look at these, you know, you can see you've got a couple counties with adult smoking rates that are higher than the state average of 15%. Um, I think the highest it was in, it was 19% in Franklin County. Children in poverty in Hamden County, you've got 31% compared to 15% of the state. Really dramatic health disparity. Um, low birth weight babies is higher in Berkshire County than in the rest of the state. 
And if you look at Hampshire County, is anyone from Hampshire County, I asked this in the last session, what is going on with your drinking water? I don't understand, but drinking water violations, I don't even really know what that means, but it's not good. And you've got 22% compared to the state at 8%. So I, you might want to think about bottled water, I'm thinking. Um, but in each county, I show you this, I know it's just a snapshot, but I show you this to say that every county in Western Mass has some health disparities. They're different, they vary, they're greater in pockets in some areas than in others, but they, you all have health inequities, you know that. And policy is a really powerful, in, impactful, effective way to impact these, this data, these statistics, in a really um, population-wide impact, right? So rather than doing individual interventions or program, programs, which are really important, through policy change, we can, we can literally change the environments that people are living in that will really impact this data. And so that's what we're talking about with policy change. We're talking about changing the environments in which people live, work, play, and pray, right? That's the phrase we hear. And that really is what it's all about. And if we change those environments, we can really improve people's health status. Policy change is the most Im impactful way to really improve what we call those social determinants of health. So income, education, housing stability, those things that drive and influence health disparities, right, or health equity. Um, and we can really do that population level change through policy. Generally, when we talk about policy advocacy, we are talking about legislation or regulation. It can also be some sort of a systems policy change, but generally we're talking about a law or a regulation. So, how do we do it? Um, we always have to start with what we call the three key questions. And if we don't start there, we're going to fail there. Um, but we work with an awful lot of clients and advocates who don't start here, who or who don't answer the questions fully or correctly. The first question is, what do you want? What is it you want to have happen? What do you want to be different at the end of the day? What is the law or policy, the regulation that you want passed or put in place? Uh, or what's the funding that you want to secure? The answer to that question needs to be very specific, and we find that often groups will jump to tactics and strategy without really intentionally and specifically answering this question. Many years ago, we had as a client the Susan G. Coleman Foundation, and we said, what do you want? And they said, we want to eradicate breast cancer as a leading cause of death among women. That is an awesome, aspirational mission and goal. We can't legislate it. There's no policy that we can pass that's going to achieve that end goal. So what do you want needs to be a very specific question answered, right, about a specific policy that you want to change. So that's the first question. The second is why do you want it? What is the data? You've got gobs of data. We heard that during the panel. You've got tons and tons of data. You've got to pull together the data that both illustrates the problem that you're looking to change and supports and defends your proposed solution. And we've got to have those answers because we'll be, that's how we're going to really propose our policy and support it and defend it. The third question is often the hardest for people to answer, and that is who has the power to give it to you? Again, this needs to be very, very specific. It is not a good answer to say the Massachusetts legislature has the power to give it to me, because that's not true. It might be one or two members of that, that decision-making or that legislative branch that really ultimately have the power. And we've got to answer that question very specifically and correctly. And you've got to make sure you've identified the right decision maker. So I'm outing myself publicly today, and it's, it's a little uncomfortable. I'm going to share with you my worst, uh, my, my ho most horrible failure as an advocate ever. Um, and so remember this story and learn from it well, because it still scars me to this day. I was working in Methuen, Massachusetts. Methuen is in the Merrimack Valley. It is the official name is the city formerly known as the town of Methuen. They do not know if they want to be a city or a town. They can't decide. Their politics are very funny and rather incestuous. A lot of people s grow up there and stay there. It's, a, it's small town politics in kind of a city. It's a little bit weird. So I was working for the Board of Health, and my job was to promote tobacco policy. And we were working to get the Board of Health to pass a regulation for smoke-free restaurants. What did we want? Smoke-free restaurants. Why did we want it? We had all the data to support and defend it. Who had the power to give it to us? Three members of the Board of Health. So we crafted a very lengthy and involved campaign. We had um, residents that wrote letters, that showed up and testified. We took an ad out in the local paper that had 300 health uh, doctors that signed a letter to the Board of Health saying, pass this policy, it's the right thing to do. We ha launched a very comprehensive, intensive campaign, and we won, or so we thought. 
We got the Board of Health to pass the policy, um, the regulation. The next day, the mayor of Methuen fired each member of the Board of Health, appointed three new members of the Board of Health, and guess what their first order of business was? To rescind our regulation. Guess what? We focused on the wrong targets. It wasn't the Board of Health members. The mayor appoints the Board of Health in the city formerly known as the town of Methuen. We did not spend any time or energy on the mayor. We focused all our energy and attention on the members of the Board of Health, and we failed miserably and publicly, and I'm still scarred. So make sure you have the right decision maker identified, and I hear it all the time. We focus our energy in the wrong place, and it doesn't usually blow up on you like that kind of a failure, but we don't usually win when we're focusing on our energies in the wrong place. So who is your target? Be very, very specific and correct in answering that question. Once you've done that, you've answered your three key questions, you're ready to launch your campaign. So how are you gonna do it? There are three things that are most important. Identifying and engaging key stakeholders, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. Identifying and engaging key partners, and then conducting strategies to influence your decision makers. Um, and we're gonna take them each in order. Um, so let's talk about key stakeholders. When I say key stakeholders or stakeholders, what I mean by that, right, are people who have a vested stake or interest in the policy that you're working on. And so we talk about um, priority populations as being the most important set of stakeholders. And what I mean by priority populations are the individuals who are gonna be most impacted by your policy change. Who's already most impacted that, by the problem that you're looking to solve? And who's gonna be most impacted by that policy change? And as Amanda talked about this morning, we want to make sure that our campaigns are going to actually reduce disparities and inequities among those most impacted. Um, and, and I've said here, between those with more privilege, and I use that word very broadly to mean, it could mean wealth, it could mean education, it could mean housing, income, any or all of those. Um, and making sure that we're really going to be improving um, health and not uh, you know, in promoting inequities. So who are the populations that are most likely to be affected and impacted by your proposed change, and where do they live? Because the communities that they live in, their lawmakers then become real priority decision makers, right? Key targets for your campaign. So we want to really think about identifying those key stakeholders and then get them engaged in our campaign and think about how are we going to engage them as grassroots advocates, as members of our coalition, as decision makers in our, co in our um, campaigns. What are all the ways we're going to engage those key stakeholders? Key partners are, this is really our coalition. How many people have ever been part of a coalition? It's a special slice of hell, isn't it? Um, why are we members of coalitions if it's a special slice of hell? Why do we do it? Anyone, why be a member of a coalition? Power, so who said it? The lady in orange said power, I think. Both of you said power. power. That's right, there's strength in numbers, right? And there's, we, we become much more powerful when we work in coalition with lots of other organizations. Um, and that's why we build coalitions. If people say to us, say to me, um, you know, my coalition gets along so well and we have no issues, I say to them, you are not doing it right. Because it should be hard. It should be hard. If you have a diverse coalition and key partners that you've recruited in all four of these segments, which I'll talk about in a second, it should be hard work and that's how you're gonna have power. So at the very core of our coalitions or our key partners are the people that share our mission. So I did um, tobacco control work for many years. Now I'm forgetting what I said to the last group and you guys, so this is where I start to say, did I already just say that? Um, one of the greatest privileges and, and successes, not another failure of my career, was leading the smoke-free workplace um, campaign in Massachusetts. And so I'll use that example of our kind of key partners. When we did that work at the core of the inner circle there, we had American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, Campaign for Tobacco for Kids, American Lung Association. Their mission sh matched our mission. They shared our mission. The next circle is where we talk about invested friends, and those are organizations that they don't have the same mission as you, but they support a lot of similar issues. So for us, the groups that fit in there were hospitals and youth serving organizations um, and community based organizations that were focused on public health issues. Those were our invested friends, valuable members of our coalition, but not at our inner core. The next circle are what we call self-interested allies, and these are organizations that if you win, if you're successful, there's a win for them. And so the example I usually give here was GlaxoSmithKline was a member of Tobacco Free Mass, our coalition. 
why would GlaxoSmithKline want to work on um, to part, as part of the Tobacco-Free Mass Coalition? Any, any ideas? The patch, NRT, nicotine replacement therapy. Absolutely, they, they make products that are cessation aid uh, quit products. And they knew, the data shows, that if people can't smoke in their workplaces, they are more likely to want to quit and to try to quit. And so they knew there'd be increased demand for their products. I don't want to get into a debate about whether pharma is a good thing to partner with or bad, because that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother workshop, as they say. Um, but they were on our coalition, and they supported our work because there was a win in it for them. Opportunistic recruits is that last circle. These are organizations that we don't typically think of. We don't, they don't share our mission. They don't work on the same issues. There's not a win in it for them. But we recruit them very specifically because they have a relationship and influence with the key decision maker, with our decision maker targets. And so sometimes you'll look at a coalition list and you'll see Sam's Towing in Springfield is on the list. And someone will say, why the hell is Sam, Sam's Towing on your, your coalition? Well, because the owner of Sam's to Towing knows our state senator really well, and Sam's Towing was willing to sign on because they're nice. Sam's a nice guy. So sometimes we recruit organizations like that. For our coalition, we had the AFL-CIO as a member of our coalition. They weren't signed on in any official capacity, and there was a win for them. They understood that if their workers quit smoking, then for sure that was that was good. You know, it was good for the unions. Um, but we recruited them to be on our campaign because the president of the AFL-CIO had a really good relationship with the Senate president, and we needed to win over the Senate president. Um, so that's why we recruited him. He was our opportunistic recruit. So when you think about key partners and recruiting them to your campaigns, you want to think about all four circles there and try to have very diverse coalitions. Once you've done all that, then we really embark on campaign strategy. This is definitely a whole uh, workshop in and of itself, but I just want to touch on this quickly. This is the framework that we in the New England office use for advocacy. We call it the power prism. And basically what this means, this says, is there are six what we call power tools. Six basic areas in which we should be doing advocacy, um, having strategies in our advocacy campaigns. And we should have comprehensive campaigns where we focus on all six areas to be successful. Research and data collection, coalition building and maintenance, fundraising and development, grassroots and key contacts, media advocacy, and decision maker advocacy. So what tends to happen in a campaign, in advocacy campaigns, is we go to our sweet spot. Maybe we're really good at media, and so we do a lot of media, but we don't really build a grassroots base of advocates because we're not as good at that or we're not as comfortable at that. When we really want to be successful in advocacy, we should be firing on all six cylinders. We don't, each organization doesn't need to do that. That's another reason we build coalitions, right? Because each organization can play a different role. And you may have some that do, are really active in one of the power tools and not in others. The term power prism is very intentional. The word power is very intentionally chosen. And some people don't like that word. When I, I told you we worked with the Susan Komen Foundation, they wanted to call it the pink prism. And I'm not making that up. The word power made them very uncomfortable because it felt just like a, like a value-laden word to them. We pushed back and said, if we're an advocate, we are trying to get people in position of power to give us what we want. We've got to build our power to do it. That's the only way to get it done. So it is about building power. So it's a very intentionally chosen, chosen word. The, um, when I mentioned when I was passing around those um, clipboards, we're this is the training we're doing in Boston on October 29th is an intensive training around the power prism. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can check that box and I'll send you um, some information. So last but not least, one of the most important, maybe the most important thing in advocacy is building relationships with lawmakers, getting to know our key decision makers. So one more show of hands. How many people in the last year have visited or called your state senator or state representative or one of their or, or an aide, one of their staff members. Awesome. Those of you who haven't, go home and do it. That's your homework. Um, it is so critically important. Um, I have been a longtime volunteer for the American Heart Association, and I was so proud this year to help them work on a campaign to mandate um, pulse oximetry screening for newborns. So it's the little ET light they put on your finger, and it can de detect a heart, um, identify a heart defect. And we, they passed a law to mandate that screening be done on every newborn born in Massachusetts. Awesome. We've been working on it for like eight years. Upskirting happened in a day. It took us eight years to get newborn screened for heart defects. But I'm not bitter about that. Um, but my point in that story is that my role in that campaign was that there's a lawmaker from Haverhill where I live 
Brian Dempsey, who happens to be the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. He's a very powerful man. He's a leader. He is not my state representative. I live in the same town, the same city, but he's not my state rep. But I got to know Chairman Dempsey through the little league in town, through just being on ball fields. And I made a point of going up and introducing myself and chatting with him, chatting him up. And when I'd be in the state house working on another issue for work, I'd stop by and say hi. That was long before he was the chair of Ways and Means. And I think that's why he likes me, because I paid attention to him before he was an important guy in the state house. Um, and because I have that nice relationship with him and he, his staff will return my calls, and sometimes he returns my calls, the American Heart Association was really able to leverage that relationship that I've built to help work on this legislation. So that was a role that I played that I was really proud and happy to play. And by the way, it took me like this much time. I didn't spend a lot of time. But when they needed a phone call put into Dempsey's office, I would do it. And I'd get a call back from his staff because they knew me. So build those relationships with your lawmakers. So, so important. Call, visit, do it often. Do it often. I think about the parent who whines and complains to the older kids and says, you never call or visit anymore. Legislators must feel like that a lot. People only come to them when they want something. Call them up, visit, stop by, go to their events. Get to know them as a person. Get to know the things that they care about and pay attention to those things. You know, if they're really active in your community advocating for, I don't know what it is, um, violence prevention issues, thank them for it. Say, hey, great job, thanks for doing that. Say thank you, nice manners, means a lot. Um, do your research, really do your homework on those lawmakers. And that would be my other homework I'd encourage you to go home and do. Spend some time Googling around and see what you can find out about those key decision makers. Once you know who that decision maker target is that you're, that you're focused on, what, do you, what can you learn about them? Who's in their inner circle? Who do they listen to? Who do they pay attention to? Who do they trust? Who might you know who knows them? And when we do our research, sometimes we find, lo and behold, we've got a board member in our organization who's a top donor to our key decision maker. Well, that's a really powerful, what we would call, pathway of influence. And so we do our homework and our research to really find that stuff out and then figure out how to craft that, how to build some strategy around that. Um, be a resource. Lawmakers deal with hundreds of issues that they largely know nothing about. So if you're focused on, you know, you're working at the YMCA or you're focused on HIV AIDS work in Western Massachusetts, let them know and say, hey, you know, if you're dealing with an issue that relates to HIV AIDS, call me up. I would love to be a resource to, to you. And guess what? They will take you up on it. Their staff will call you because they don't know a whole lot about the issues that come before them. There's so many of them. There are thousands of bills that they have to deal with each year. You can't possibly be an expert on all of them. So offer yourself up as a resource and they'll really, really appreciate that. Um, invite them to your events and go to their events. Really important. Show up at their tables and invite them to yours. Don't ask for a million dollars on the first date. Kind of good manners, right? Um, I think that what I mean by this obviously is just don't, we don't want to make a huge ask of a lawmaker in our first conversation. Cultivate that relationship, build that relationship. You know, if you do, how many people do fundraising and development in their organizations? Any development folks in the room? How long does it take typically to cultivate a major donor? Nine months to a year. Nine months to a year. Mm -hmm. Four years. Four years. <laughs> and that's how long it can take to cultivate a decision maker, right? You're asking them to write a pretty big check at the end of the day, right? Not, not literally, but figuratively. You're asking them to change a law or an act of law. It's a big ask. And so we want to really think about how to, how to cultivate that relationship before we make the big asks. And share your personal stories. Personal stories are so incredibly powerful. They are what sells the issue to your lawmaker. So share your stories. Talk about why the issue is important to you personally. Have the other people in your communities and your constituents and the people you work with share their personal stories. Hugely powerful and that will, they, that will be memorable to them and they will remember you. And I want to just sort of um, end with this quote by Ben Franklin because um, Ben Franklin said, if you would persuade, you must appeal to interest rather than intellect. I do not imply, I'm not intending to imply that lawmakers are unintelligent people. That is not true. They are smart people. What I am saying and what Ben Franklin was saying here is that what really makes us say yes or no when we're asked to do something is what's in our motivated self-interest. What's in it for us? Is it good or bad for us? That's how humans make decisions. And if you think about yourself and your own life, that's how you make decisions every day. Is it good for you? Is it good for your family? Is it good for your friends and neighbors? That's how we make our decisions. And as advocates, we have to figure out what's in it for that lawmaker to give us what we want. What's in it for them? 
Lawmakers run for public office because they want to do good things for their constituents in their district. In order to do that, they need to stay in office. That means they need to get what? Reelected. Re and so what their constituents care about really, really matters to them. And so they care a lot about what their constituents want. We need to mo appeal to that. Our number one job as advocates is to make it easy for decision makers to say yes or to make it really, really uncomfortable for them to say no. That's our number one job as an advocate. That's about pressure and influence. And with that, on time again, I'm going to wrap up. My contact information is here. Business cards are here if you want to grab one of those. Don't forget the, the take-home tool. Um, the clipboards are still making their way around.